I have a confession to make this morning. I made a promise, and I uh, didn't keep it, at least not yet. Um, the Kylas were, uh, were here on Wednesday night, and Judah is prepping his car for uh, the, the Iwana Grand Prix, which is this Wednesday. And he asked me, I, I, I recently acquired a bandsaw, and he asked me to make a cut out of his car. He had been at my house earlier in the week prepping his car, and he needed this thing cut. He couldn't come over. They were leaving town for a couple of days to go um, get away during spring break. And, and I said, oh, yeah, no problem. Give it to me. I'll, I'll make the cut. It'll be a piece of cake. And then life happened. And, you know, I didn't prioritize the car like I should. I didn't get it done. It is still at my house, and it is still uncut. I'm sorry, Judah. And uh, that is just um, one example of numerous broken promises that I have made in my life. My poor children suffer from the same fate that Judah is suffering from this morning, um, only more often. Uh, I tell them I'm going to do something and I either get caught up with things in work or I just forget. I'm so focused on myself and what I think needs to get done that I neglect what I tell my kids that I'm going to do. I'm sure that, if, that for many of you there's probably examples as well of me telling you I was going to do something and failing to follow through on my word. And I, I, I'm probably worse at it than most of you, but I'm sure I'm not the only one who's broken a promise or two in this life. We all break our promises. In fact, it's kind of a, a natural thing for people to do. You know who we point to most often as promise breakers is our government, right? They make promises to us. We're in election season already and amping up to November and isn't it great we're going to hear all kinds of promises from political uh, running people who are running for political office and you know what will probably happen as soon as they get into office I don't think they probably intend to break their promises they're probably just going to get so busy that the, and there's going to be so many things that are thrown at them that there is no way that they can possibly follow through on everything that they hope to accomplish while they're in office I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt anyway but the fact of the matter is, is that people break promises all the time. We make promises that we cannot keep. Or in the worst cases, we make promises that we never intend to keep. But the good news is, is that God is not like us. And even better news for all of you, God is not like me. In breaking promises. Today is Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday is the day that we set aside to mark the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. He rode on a donkey, and we know the, the story well. They grabbed the palm branches, and they waved them and laid them in front of the donkey as he walked over them. They put their coats on the donkey, and he sat on them, and they sang praise to God from Psalm 118 as he entered into Jerusalem. It was a glorious day for Jerusalem. It was a day that had been promised and was now coming to pass. It was a glorious day for Israel. But why do we celebrate it today? There may be some in here who have some Jewish heritage or Jewish ethnicity in their bloodline, their DNA, but probably slim to none for most of us. Why would we care about a Jewish king riding on a donkey into a city almost 2,000 years ago? Why is that a big deal for us? Why has the church celebrated this Sunday for 2,000 years? I want you to recognize that although Christ rode in and was hailed as king, he still is not sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. In 
Instead, five days later, he was executed as a criminal by the religious leaders of Judaism. But, there's a, but, but this Sunday is still important. Even though Christ isn't on a literal throne in Jerusalem yet, I believe he will be someday. And even though they crucified him five days later, Palm Sunday is significant for us. I think the first reason why is because it identifies Jesus in an important way. He came as the Messiah, the King that was promised in the Old Testament. Zechariah 9, 9 in particular emphasizes the fact that the King would come on a donkey, riding into Jerusalem, endowed with salvation. And that, even the fact that I mentioned that prophecy in Zechariah 9 9 actually points to the second reason why Palm Sunday is so important. And, and it's actually what I think that, that even Psalm 118 is driving us toward, even as it talks about Palm Sunday. It's that God kept his promise on Palm Sunday. God had promised to send a king, and he had promised this king. A long time ago. The first, the first instance of the king being prophesied happened is recorded in Genesis. At the end of Genesis, as Jacob is blessing his sons, he blesses Judah and he says, The scepter will not depart from Judah. Later on, as, as, the, as Israel enters the land and they become established, eventually there's kings who come to reign over Israel. And one of those kings, who is the most prominent of all of the Israelite kings, King David, was made a promise from God. Was given a promise from God, and that promise was that your, your sons shall forever reign in Jerusalem. And, and the, the prophecies go on. We, we can point to Zechariah 9.9. 9. We could point to Daniel chapter 9. And verses 24 through 26, which I believe is an explicit prophecy that points in detail to the very day of Palm Sunday. But I don't have time to explain that to you today, but I'd love to have the conversation sometime if you want to hear it. But then, wait a second. You're, Pastor Roy, you're saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy and that Palm Sunday reminds us that God keeps his promises and that he promised that this king would come, but the king isn't there. He's not on the throne in Jerusalem. How can it possibly mark the fulfillment of prophecy? But I, want you to, I just want you to recognize that this reminds us that God does keep his promises. And that means he, if, he, if he did it then, he's going to keep doing it. And there's all kinds of evidence of this in Scripture, that God keeps promises he doesn't keep them when we want him to necessarily or when we think he should, but he's always keeping his promises. And the fact that Jesus showed up at all is a fulfillment of multiple promises in the Old Testament and covenants that were handed down to Adam, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David, to Solomon, and through all the prophets. When Jesus rode in on that donkey in Jerusalem that day, God was saying, listen, just in case you doubted me, I'm keeping my promise. Here's my king. Worship him, follow him, serve him, and serve me. And, and Psalm 118 comes into play into all of this because this is the song that they sang. I mentioned that already. Maybe you caught it. Especially probably verse 26 stands out to you. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But there's another part of that song that maybe you can't find in here. In fact, we sang it a couple of times today already as we were preparing our hearts for worship and were worshiping God. It was the word Hosanna. And believe it or not, Hosanna is actually in Psalm 118 too. Not, the ver not verse 2, as well. In fact, it comes in verse 25. O oh Lord, do save, we pray. This is the word, Hosanna. And it is, it is a prayer more than a song of praise. It is a prayer that says, oh God, save us, deliver us. 
And this song, Psalm 118, that they sang as they, they probably sang it frequently. In fact, they probably sang, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord to many people who came into Jerusalem at the Passover time. But this was different. This, is, this was the unique one, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And here, in Psalm 118, it, there's something that's emphasized, a big picture that's emphasized, that as we think about the reality of, of what they're saying in verses 25 and 26, that, they, that we actually have recorded that they sang in, at the original Palm Sunday, it, it keeps driving us back to the faithfulness of God. I don't know if you noticed this in Psalm 118, as Pastor Nate read it just a few moments ago, but there is a lot of repetition in this psalm. There is repetition at the beginning, and there's um, in particular, and at the end, that marks out, I think, the emphasis of this psalm. Did you catch what was repeated there? I'm sure you can see it if you've got your Bibles open there. For his loving kindness is everlasting. For his loving kindness is everlasting. His loving kindness is everlasting. His loving kindness is everlasting. At, and verse 29, his loving kindness is everlasting. Now we might think that this psalmist, he's repeating himself over and over again. I mean, come on, man. Use a little variety here, right? Our, I mean, he, was the psalmist lazy? Is that the problem here? He's just a lazy poet. Couldn't think of anything better to say, so I guess I'll just repeat myself over and over again. No, no, no. The psalmist repeats himself to emphasize something, and he wants, us to, em he wants to emphasize for us this reality, that God's loving kindness is everlasting. Loving kindness, that word is very important in the Hebrew language. The word that's translated loving kindness points to the loyalty of God to his covenant obligations. And this entire psalm is about that, God's faithfulness to his covenant obligations. Every year we celebrate, when we celebrate Palm Sunday, it is a reminder to us that God, God is faithful to his covenant obligations, to the promises that he makes. He's not going to forget his promises. He's not going to forget what he said he'd do. This is particularly important when we consider what happened just five days later, especially when we consider Good Friday in light of Palm Sunday. Here, Jesus is going to get cut off. The Messiah is going to get cut off and die. But you know what? That was prophesied too. In fact, in Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 26, where it says, where I, which I think is the most explicit prophecy about Palm Sunday, it actually says that the Messiah will be cut off. Isaiah 53 also predicts the death of the Messiah. And, and so what we find here is that even in the midst of days of darkness and death and despair and doubt like Good Friday, we need to look no further than Psalm 118 or the, and Palm Sunday to remind us that God's faithfulness to his covenant love and his promises will never cease. Psalm 118 is grounding this truth. It's grounding us in this truth that God's faithful love never ends. And it emphasizes this by praising five highlights of God's unending faithful love. Let me just walk through these five highlights of God's unending faithful love with you as we, um, in the rest of our time. The first is that he is a shielding ally. The first highlight of God's unending faithful love is that he is a shielding ally. Verses 5 through 9. From my distress I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What, man, what can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Now I purposely emphasize the things that were repeated in here. The psalmist here is looking at his past and he has these two phrases that he repeats in these verses. The first is that God is for me. This is God as an ally. He is for us. And, and here's the thing. We don't know who or when, who, this, who wrote this poem. Psalm, we don't know when it was written, and I don't think it matters. What is most important is the God of this psalm 
who deserves the focus. And he is the God who is with us. He is for us. God is not trying to get you. Now, you might think sometimes when life is turning away from what you plan for it to go, the way you plan for it to go, when things, when, when, when there's a curveball thrown at you and you're expecting a fastball, you might think that God is forgotten and that maybe God isn't for you. Maybe God's actually against you. We have, we have ways of convincing ourselves of this reality. But the fact of the matter is, is that the psalmist repeats this for a reason. The Lord is for me. And that means the Lord is for you. If you are one of God's people, God is for you. He's going to fight for you. He's going to help you. And he says here, I will not fear because of that. And in particular, he talks about what can man do to me. But what can anything do to us? What can death and sickness and pain do to us when God is for us? Nothing. I say, and he's going to get to that in a moment. But then the other phrase that's repeated is that it's better to take refuge in the Lord. It emphasizes that God is a shield or a refuge for his people. He's a safe place to go. And this just is emphasized all the more of the idea of God being for us. If he's a refuge and a shield for us. Man will fail you. You can put your hope in people all you want, but they will let you down. It doesn't matter if they're politicians. It doesn't matter if it's your kids or your spouse or your boss or your neighbors or your best friend. They will fail you at some time. I've just talked about how I failed people. I failed Judah. I failed my kids. I failed you in multiple ways, not keeping my promises. I'm going to let you down. Put your hope in me and guaranteed you're going to get disenfranchised at some point. But put your hope in God. Make him your refuge and see that he is for you and you will never be let down. He exceeds whatever refuge man can offer because he is God. He's eternal. We so quickly take our eyes off of God as we face the difficulties of life. And we often, the, the first place we turn is to humans for answers. But God is for you. He's better than a financial stopgap. He's better than a health insurance plan. He's better than a retirement plan. He's better than a politician. He's better than whatever you have trouble trusting him for than any other option or any human wisdom could possibly come up with. Will you trust him? He is dependable because he's for us. And he's the best refuge. And so we see that he is a shielding ally, but he is also a strengthening presence. A strengthening presence. In verses 10 through 14, we see this strengthening presence. Look again and listen for the repetition. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They were extinguished as a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. You pushed me violently so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Still, the psalmist is talking about his past, and again, we look to the repetition to get to the point. Do you see all the surrounding that's happening here? Do you ever feel like this? Do you ever feel like it's that the nations are surrounding you, that they surround you like bees, that it's just like a constant buzz and you can't get rid of them? Do you imagine like having bees surrounding you and how crazy that would drive you? There's all this surrounding, and, and we feel surrounded too, right? By to-do lists, by bosses, by kids, by enemies, all of the things that are trying. It seems like all of these things are trying to tear us down, beat us down, destroy us. But do you notice what else was repeated? Even as it repeated all of the surrounding, it kept emphasizing in the name of the Lord, in the name of Yahweh, I will cut them off. Notice how the strength 
notice, I'm sorry, where the strength to defeat his enemies comes from. It is in the name of the Lord. This, this idea of the name of Yahweh is, is a statement about the presence of God, that he is there. Because the name Yahweh itself emphasizes being. It's basically just God saying, I am, I exist, and I'm never going away. It's the presence of God that is emphasized in the name of God. And and when we talk about um, cutting off our enemies in the name of the Lord, it is not, it's, it's actually more of a submission to him. Just like we pray in the name of Jesus. When we pray in the name of Jesus, it's not just a magical phrase that we say to get what we want, but it's actually a submission to the will and plan of God. It's saying, what you want, God, is what I want in this prayer. And so when we close our prayers in the name of Jesus, amen, we are praying in submission to him and in acknowledgement of the fact that he hears us because of Jesus and his sacrifice. And so where does salvation come from then? Salvation comes from the the name of Jesus, the righteousness of Christ applied to our account. Where does salvation come from here? In the name of Yahweh. And this isn't um, repeated in the same way here, but the the idea of him being, in the name of the Lord is emphasizing the presence, but the The strengthening is emphasized not with so much repetition of a specific word, but of repetition of an idea. Verse 13, the second half, the Lord helped me. Verse 14, the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my song. He has become my salvation. So here, instead of using the same word, he repeats an idea, and he uses all of these synonyms to point us to the fact that, that there's this strength from God that can help us. God wins the victory by his power and for his name. This is why he's working in your life. It's so that he receives the glory, but it's his strengthening presence that can help us in this. You see, we see this all over the New Testament as well, but uh, the passage that comes to mind uh, is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul says, that he had this weakness in the flesh and this thorn in the flesh that he wanted God to take away. And God says, but my strength is perfected in your weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. And maybe if we trusted the grace of God to be sufficient for us in the midst of our weakness and in the midst of our stress and in the midst of our surrounded by whatever it is that we feel like is surrounding us at any moment in time, that if we would see grace in it, then we could, we could say, I have no sufficiency of myself, as Paul says earlier in 2 Corinthians, but my sufficiency is of God. You see, yes, you don't have sufficiency. You don't have enough. You don't have enough strength. But God does. Will you trust him? Will you lean on him? Will you see that he is a faithful Faithful God, never failing you. He's a shielding ally. He's a strengthening presence. And third, he's a life-giving hero. A life-giving hero, verses 15 through 18. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I will not die, but live. And tell the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. You see the repetition here? Again, the right hand of the Lord. God's strength, again, emphasized. But this idea of valiant, it points more to a a courage. Like the courage of a hero that we would look to and trust in the midst of our difficulty. And now we come back to this idea of life. The life that God gives. Notice what he says in verse 17. I will not die, but live. 
And then he says, he has not given me over to death. Now, this is an interesting conundrum because the psalmist, whoever wrote this, I don't know who it is, but I am 100% sure about this fact. He's dead. So the psalmist is dead, but he says, I will not die, but live. And he has not given me over to death. And, I, and I'm so thankful that in, in the providence of God, I got to hear my, my colleague and brother in Christ, Daniel Rigney, who just lost his wife to cancer, preach at her memorial service yesterday and remind us of what Jesus says in John chapter 11. Because Jesus says in John chapter 11 that he is the resurrection and the life. And that we will live even if we die. And whoever lives and believes in him will never die. And he reminded us yesterday that although Kayla's body is in a grave, that she is alive. She's alive because she believed in Jesus Christ. And there is no death for those who believe in Jesus. There is only life. And that is what the psalmist is pointing to. Not to the fact that his body wasn't going to be put into a grave someday, but that when he died, he was going to live. And there is a resurrection going to happen that is going to reunite the living Kayla Rigney with her body and the living psalmist to his body. And they are going to live forever in the presence of God and in his glory in the new Jerusalem that's talked about in Revelation 20 and 21 and 22. This is the reality that we hope for. This is what we're driving towards with Easter. So I'll, I'll leave some of this joy and hope and life for next Sunday too. But the fact of the matter is, is that it doesn't go away on Palm Sunday either. And it certainly doesn't get squashed on Good Friday. The fact of the resurrection and the hope of life is what drives us every single day of our lives. We won't die. I'm not going to die. But I will live. And this is, this is reality. This is hope. This is much bigger than a, than a cancer prog and, uh, and a grim prognosis. It's so much bigger than the things that they're arguing about in St. Paul, about whether we should, whether physicians should assist people in taking their own lives. When we see that we will not die but live, we recognize that everything about life is good and a gift of God. And we live for life. And it will never be taken away from us. And so we see that he's a shielding ally. He's a strengthening presence. He's a life-giving hero. And fourthly, he is a saving way. He is a saving way. Verses 19 through 21. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I will give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. I shall give thanks to you for you have answered me and you have become my salvation. This is why God is a better refuge as he talks about in verses 8 and 9. Why is God a better refuge? Because he saves us from what we really need saving from. You see, you can get really focused on all of the enemies that surround you uh, in this life. Um, and, and sometimes those are actual people, but more often than not, the problems and the enemies that we face in life are actually more like just complicated life situations, right? A tough, a tough doctor's visit, a, a, a tough boss, a, a, or a, a tough job, just in general, um, stress, just so much to do, so much weighing down on us. We feel like, how can we ever make it through? And all we want is just relief from all the stress and anxiety and all of the craziness of life, right? But God says, listen, there's a bigger problem here. And, and it's emphasized again in the repetition here. What is what is emphasized? Well, there's this idea of righteousness emphasized here. And the presence of God. Open to me the gates of righteousness. 
and I shall enter through them. I will give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. So this is the Lord's gate. It's the, Lord, it's the gate that we enter through to see the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. So here's the problem, right? We are all sinners. We've emphasized this already in our service during our time of confession as we talked about the reality of our hearts that are often bent toward wickedness. And the reality is that every one of us is like this. There's not a certain single person in this room who's better than any of anyone else when it comes to standing before God and who hasn't sinned enough to deserve hell. Every single one of us is in that boat. From the moment that we're born, we are sinners by state, disposition, and action. And so what's, what's our hope? What, what do we do about that? We can't go before a holy, righteous God as a sinner in state, disposition, and action. We need to be changed. And that's where righteousness comes in. But you, it's not as though we can somehow conjure it up on our own. Like, oh, I know, I'll just keep all the rules for the rest of my life. As if. Right? You've been failing at that since the moment you were born. You can't keep all the rules. You're just going to keep screwing it up. And so what are you going to do? Who do you turn to? Where is the hope for the sinner and the person who recognizes that they're not good enough and that they can't get themselves to heaven? Well, that's where righteousness comes in. Who becomes his salvation in verse 21? Not himself. God does. God saves. God declares us righteous. God makes it possible for us to enter into the presence of God. Wait a second, what? Yeah, God is the one who, who justifies sinners, declares them righteous, so that when we walk into his presence, he, doesn't, he no longer sees the rebellious, wicked heart that's worthless that we talked about from Proverbs 10, but he sees the righteous, living Son of God in us. And so we get saved. We get saved from what we really need salvation from. You might think you need, you need to be saved from all of the chaos of your life, but what you really need is salvation from your sin. You, you might think that you need to get saved from the debt that you have. Maybe you're just over your head in debt. You, you just can't see a way out. You can barely keep the bills paid. You need salvation from God for your soul, from your sin. Because that is what's really destroying you, much more than your financial difficulties, much more than the chaos of your home and the stress of your heart. And this is, this is what we hope in, the salvation, the saving way of God. God is a saving way. And he tells us that he made this visible in the person of Jesus Christ when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one enters the gates of righteousness but by me. And then finally, the fifth of our proofs here of God's covenant keeping is that he is a covenant keeping God. God's faithfulness, the fact that his loving kindness is everlasting, it never ends, is seen in the fact that he's a covenant keeping God. This is the strongly prophetic section that ends this psalm. It's the part that we think of. Verse 22 is quoted in Matthew 21, 42, Mark 12, 10 and 11, Luke 20, 17, Acts 4, 11, Ephesians 2, 20, 1 Peter 2, 7. Like, there, you got enough New Testament quotes of verse 22. Verse 25 also is quoted during the Passion Week in all of the Gospels in Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you'll notice that the emphasis on what God is doing here in verses 23 and 24. In verses 23 and 24, he says, This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I would understand this as the psalmist's confidence that God will make all of this a reality by making the rejected stone the best and the most obvious. He's going to ordain a specific day. That is the day that Jesus walked into Jerusalem. And what are they praying for? They're praying for prosperity and salvation in verse 25. Oh Lord, do save. Oh Lord, do send prosperity. And understand when he says prosperity, he's not just talking about, you know, a lot of wealth and, you know, big TVs and mansions and lots of food everywhere. But, but he's talking about He's talking about a, a, a spiritual prosperity 
that would come only through Christ. Now, there is an actual physical prosperity that will happen in that. I mean, read Revelation 21 and 22 and see what the new heavens and the new earth are going to look like. And it's hard to argue that that's not prosperous. But don't get, the, don't get your, your times messed up in thinking about what, when the prosperity comes. That prosperity can't happen until Christ is sitting on the throne and establishing peace through his name. And here's what he does. He just, he does what, he, he's going to fulfill these promises. He's going to keep his covenant. And he did it when he brought Jesus into Jerusalem. And he's going, and he's still doing it today. He's still keeping his promise. Because here's the reality. When, when we think about the fact that God will always act in his faithful covenant keeping love. And we try to remind ourselves of that. That, that God's loving kindness is everlasting. And we, we can remind ourselves of that and say it over and over and over again. And keep clinging to that hope. The reality is, is that we look at Psalm 118 and we're like, wait a second. That was written a long time ago. In fact, it was written a long time before Jesus ever even came. I mean, bare minimum, it was written after the exile, which is... At four to five hundred years, I guess four hundred years before Jesus would have walked through that gate in Jerusalem. Maybe it was written before that. The promise that the king, that there would be a king and a scepter in Judah, that was happened. I mean, that happened before the Exodus, when God promised through Jacob to Judah that the scepter would not depart. He promised to David. Thousands of years before not only the exile, but then also the return from exile, and then Jesus actually coming. Maybe people in, Psalm, in the days of Psalm 118 thought God had forgotten. Maybe the people who were alive when Jesus actually walked through that gate thought that he had forgotten. Do you ever feel like God has forgotten his promises to you? There's one promise in particular that, that I... I, that I think is super important for us as Christians. It's in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. There are numerous important, important uh, promises that God gives us in the Word of God. But I, I think this one is very, very important because Paul says, I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's Philippians 1.6. And, and I wonder if you sometimes think, I think God forgot me in that promise. Because like, I, I keep trying to be like Jesus, but I keep falling flat on my face. Day after day after day, I keep screwing it all up. I'm not getting right. I still get angry with my kids. I still disobey my parents. I still frustrate my teachers. I still don't get my homework done like I'm supposed to. I still am lazy on my job, or I feel lazy at least, and I want to be lazy, or I, I'm doubting, and I'm fearful, and I'm in all of these things, and we feel like, man, God, I, I want you to take this thing away. I want you to make me righteous. I want you to make me look like Jesus. Would you please? And then God works in his timing and in his way, and it's slow. But, it, but just because it doesn't happen when we want it to, or when we think it should, like we have an idea, like God, just make me like Jesus today, and it'll be just fine. Everything will be great. Well, maybe, but if God doesn't do that, I trust him to be wise enough to always make the best decision in that regard. And maybe he knows that you becoming like Jesus over the long term with slow change and slight incremental advance is exactly what you need to keep trusting him and not to get inflated um, with your ego about thinking about how good you are and comparing yourself to everybody else and, and being self-righteous and, and just falling back into sin again. Yes, could God just remove all of our temptation? Of course he could. But he doesn't. Why? Because this is the, the best way for him to show his glory and his, his wisdom in you. And this is actually what he talks about in Ephesians chapter 3 when he talks about the manifold wisdom of God displayed in the church. You see, if you didn't need any help, if you were just like Jesus, you'd probably be trying to tell the rest of us all what we need to do. And then you'd probably get frustrated with all of us because we'd keep screwing it up. And then on top of that, we don't, like, where's the, where, where do we get to help you grow? Where do we get to speak into the truth in your life? Where's our role 
in helping you become like Jesus because that's what Ephesians 4 tells us that this is for. This church, this gathering is for us to speak truth to each other in love so that we might grow up into him who is our head, even Christ. Isn't that, that's mind-boggling that God has such a wise and extraordinary plan that he doesn't even finish his work in us immediately because he wants it to be a process so that all of you can speak into my life and so that I can speak into yours. Wow. You see, God is keeping his promise. Maybe not exactly like how you think he should or when you think he should, but he's keeping it. And it's happening every time we speak truth to each other. Every time you say, when you hear the word of God, yes, I believe that and I'm going to try to live that. And it just keeps happening. And it's just, we're all kind of like moving toward Jesus. It's slow sometimes. Sometimes it's even imperceptible. But it's happening because God keeps his word. And he proved it on Palm Sunday. He proved it when Jesus walked through that gate in Jerusalem on that donkey. And those people sang Psalm 118. Oh, Lord, save us. It's the same song that we sing today. Oh, Lord, save us. Make us like Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us and the word of God. Thank you for your faithfulness to your promises. Thank you for transforming us into the image of your son, Jesus. I pray that you would help us to be faithful in believing your promises. Help us to guard against doubt and fear and giving up. Help us not to lose heart because we believe that you are keeping your promises. And when we aren't, when we can't, when you just can't see it anymore, when we're, we're blinded by all of the trouble and struggle that life throws our way, May you bring each other to our lives so that we can speak truth that way too. We can hear it from each other and give us the courage to speak it to each other so that the, the life of Christ might be seen in us and our hope in the promises that you make and never fail in will be what guards and guides us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.